Hello everybody, welcome to the Personal Excellence Web Lectures. Today's topic is about emotional eating. Now before I go into today's topic, just one quick reminder that the web lectures and the podcasts are really meant as supplementary information to the existing articles that are on PE, which is personalexcellence.co. So know that all the web lectures that I've done so far are based on existing articles and they are meant to be supplementary. So for the really like the full detailed information, always refer to the articles because they have all the information, they are detailed, they are structured uh, nicely in organized fashion, and they have examples to back up each point. And um, use the web lectures and podcasts as a way to reinforce the information that you have already gained and gleaned from the articles. So today's topic is about emotional eating. How to overcome emotional eating? Well, I guess emotional eating for myself is a topic that's very close to the heart. Um, ever since I was young, my parents have really just used food as a symbol of love. They just used food as a way to express their love. So some of you might have heard of this concept, which is about the language of love. And there are different languages of love. Um, and the language of love is defined as the way the person knows how to express his or her love. So some people may have the language, um, may use physical touch as the language of love. So hugging, caressing, touching, you know, physical contact, that is their language of love. And some people's language of love can be words, verbal communication, and um, people who are like writers or poets, and, and people who just basically like to communicate and talk and speak for these people, verbal communication would then be the language of love. So for my parents, I guess um, their language of love was really just food. Since I was young, they just used food as a way to express their love. And I guess part of that might be because food was a scarcity when they were young. They were brought up in times when food was rarely available. So there would be times where they probably did not have enough food for a day and then they had to make do or they have to split between like the very the little amount of food that was already available to the family. So wherever there was like an abundance of food, it was seen as a good thing. It was seen as luxury. So I guess being brought up in uh, an environment like that made them then overcompensate in terms of how they uh, deal with food today, especially my mom because uh, she has a tendency to buy a lot of food, a lot more than what the family actually needs. She has a tendency to overcook, like uh, she would cook large quantities of food even though there's just no way like um, the family members are able to finish them. So, uh, and she, she likes to buy a lot of food home as well, like a lot more than anybody needs. And my parents have the tendency to sort of just stock up food at home. So they'll stock up the cabinets with food and the fridge with food and um, the, the kitchen would just be filled with food. And a lot of times they, they would be junk food, like highly processed food, um, fried food, oily food, and just not very healthy food. So, um, and, and that's just like how um, they sort of raised me and my, and my brother. Like they just used food as a way of expressing their love. So apart from buying food home, a lot of times they would always check whether I was hungry. They would always check whether I needed to eat they will always ensure that I was properly fed every single moment. So to them, it's better to be overfed and just to overeat than not have food at all. And I guess in any event where I was hungry um, or, or I was not properly fed, they will see it as them not having fulfilled their duties as parents. So that was just how I was brought up. Food was the symbol of love. And I guess as a child of impressionable age and uh, not knowing how things should be and not being conscious of the world out there and not being able to really uh, form conscious thoughts at that time, I was then brought up that way. Like I then just saw food as love, subconsciously even, like it's not even like a conscious recognition. So I guess then growing up, I just started to use food as a way of loving myself without even knowing that. And it's only um, in the recent years when I really 
worked on becoming healthier, being more conscious about my diet, my weight, what I eat. It's, it's only at this time that I realized that I actually had difficulty keeping to my diet plans. And when I really looked into why that was the case, I found out it was because of my underlying food beliefs and my food issues that was keeping me from adhering to my desired ideal diet, which then kept me from being at my ideal weight. Now, today, my food issues are completely addressed. Like, I have uh, totally, I went deep in to my subconsciousness is just um, unrooted one erroneous food belief after another and just kept clearing them out. It was really an arduous process and I'm really happy to say like today my relationship with food has been restored to the way that it should be, the healthy state rather than um, a love-hate relationship or one whereby I saw food as something that it isn't. It took me about a year, I guess, uh, where I was really going deep to understand uh, my food issues and really addressing that. So probably from about um, last year, February, uh, was when I did a 21-day water fast. That marked the start where I realized that uh, my food issues were so deep, like beyond my comprehension. I guess when you don't go for food for 21 days, it really makes you see food in a totally different light. So the water fast was the beginning of my healing journey with food. And then uh, from there on, it made me discover more and more about my underlying food beliefs. Early this year, a few months ago, was when I guess I gained a total complete closure with regards to my twisted relationship with food. So looking back, it has really been an incredible journey. Um, I have learned a lot about myself. I would say that people who experience emotional eating issues probably feel really miserable and they probably wish that they don't have such problems. But when you overcome that, I mean, see it as something to help you become better. Like, if you have an, an issue with food, that just represents that there's something to be addressed, an opportunity for you to become a better person. And when you really work on that and you overcome that, you and you will overcome that if you want to work on it, you will emerge a person who is just totally stronger than before, more conscious than before, more aware than before. And you will gain such an enlightened view surrounding uh, things in life, including food, that other people will not be able to understand. So see it as um, something that's good and don't hate it because when you hate it, when you resist it, it will persist. I guess like in the past, there were times where I just, when I was still struggling with the emotional eating issue, like there were times where I just, I guess I just resented my parents. I like, just hated them. Like I wish I had parents who didn't bring me up that way or didn't have food issues that then became passed on to me based on the way that they raised me. But that was the way, the only reason why I felt that way was because I felt that I was overpowered by the problem. Like I felt that I couldn't overcome it at all. And when I look back now that, I mean, whatever that happened, all they were were just neutral occurrences. At the end of the day, in life, everything that happens to you is a neutral occurrence. Whether it's positive or negative, it's really up to how you perceive it. So don't see your emotional eating issue as like a disease or something that you hate. Just recognize that it is what it is. And the sooner you stop, stop resisting it, the sooner you start to see it as something uh, to be addressed, to be understood, and then the sooner you will overcome this problem. So for the first part of today's web lecture, I'm going to share how you can go about tackling the um, emotional eating as an issue. And then for the second part of the web lecture, I will give you uh, practical tips on how you can rebuild and restore a healthy relationship with food. 
Okay, so for the first part um, of the web lecture, tackling emotional eating. Emotional eating, the very important thing that you must recognize is that emotional eating comes as a result of a twisted relationship with food. And your twisted relationship with food comes from the false erroneous beliefs you have surrounding food and eating. So you have to recognize that at the end of the day, food is food. Eating is eating. And I think the society has sort of built this story and this illusion around food whereby suddenly we can fall in love with food and uh, food can be sinful, it can be decadent, and uh, we will be guilty if we eat this thing. Like, there are just a lot of emotions that are thrown into uh, the whole notion of food and eating. I guess in part due to the great, quote unquote, great marketing skills by the marketers. And as a result, um, watching all this advertising and, and seeing all these descriptions surrounding food has made us attach emotions to the notion of food and eating. And that is totally not necessary at all. Because, okay, let me give you an example. Have you ever seen a pen and just thought to yourself, my gosh, I'm so in love with this pen. Or have you ever like or used a pen and then say, I feel so guilty for using this. I shouldn't use this at all. Okay, so some of you might be thinking that I'm crazy. Like most people would not even think of a pen that way. Like a pen is just a pen. You use it to write. Like that's all it is. And, but the funny thing th that is that's precisely what food and eating is about. Food is food. Food is here to fuel our bodies so we can survive, live a healthier life, and really um, nourish ourselves and give us energy to live our days and to do what we want to do. So food is like our fuel to support us. It is something neutral, just like how a pen, a piece of paper, a table, a laptop, etc. Like the, all of these are. So the, the, that's the funny thing is whenever I try to say something like this, um, some readers may start reacting defensively, saying like, food is like an enjoyment, like you should totally learn to enjoy food and you, you should stop uh, telling people not to enjoy food. And that is totally missing the point altogether because what most of these people are reacting from is from the emotional attachments to food. And when someone tries to tell them about the neutral state of food, they then become very, very angry and angsty because they feel like their, their emotional attachment or their relationship with food is sacred. And uh, for anyone to try to tarnish or try to play down that relationship, they then feel attacked. And the funny thing is these same people who usually react this way are the same people who usually fall off a certain diet who are unable to stick to a certain way of eating, who have uh, problems achieving their ideal weight, and so on and so forth. So I think that the big thing here is to realize that food is really just neutral. Eating is neutral. You can enjoy food while you eat, but if you start eating because you want to feel certain emotions, because you want to... Um, feel certain, uh, feed certain emotions, then that's when you know that something is wrong. So note the instrumentality here. It is different. Like the first scenario, you eat to fuel yourself and you enjoy and appreciate food as you eat. It's totally different from eating because you want to feel happy. Okay, that those two are totally different and separate situations. They may seem the same on the surface, but if you really look at the underlying drivers, they are really very different. So this part, which is um, about tackling the causes of emotional eating, is important because it's really about going deep down, a deep dive into what is making you eat emotionally, understanding the drivers, the, the beliefs they are wrong, and from there, you can then work to address these erroneous beliefs. So here, I'm going to share with you an exercise. 
And um, this exercise is part of the emotional eating series that I have on personal excellence. And um, it is in part five of the series. And uh, you can see the series at personalexcellence.co slash blog slash emotional dash eating. Okay, so now let's go to the exercise, which is step one. Step one is to identify your emotional eating triggers. So again, like I said, emotional eating is the symptom, the effect, the outcome of your erroneous beliefs. It's hard to sort of try to pinpoint what the beliefs are if you don't even know where to start. So the easiest way to get started is to first identify your emotional eating triggers because those reflect the times when there's something amiss. There's something just, just subconsciously driving you to eat more than you should. So let's say for example, um, you have a map out a diet plan for yourself and this diet plan is perfectly sound. It is not a starvation, extreme low calorie diet. It is in line with your energy needs and still being able to provide the calorie deficit that will help support you in your weight loss goal. So you have your breakfast, you have your lunch and then when it comes to dinner, you have it as well and theoretically, you have met your calorie needs for the day. But after a certain point, you feel like you need to eat. And this is weird because you have already consumed your calorie needs for the day. But yet, you still feel like eating. You just feel like it's wrong if you don't eat. So this is a potential emotional eating trigger. Another example of an emotional eating trigger would be, say, if you are working and your boss gives you more work or a colleague says something to you. And for some reason, at this point, at this point, you suddenly feel like grabbing a chocolate bar and eating that. Okay, so this is a potential emotional eating trigger to look at. Another example would be, say, let's say it's Saturday night. Okay, um, all your friends are out having fun, drinking, and then you're at home, you're feeling a little bit bored, and um, you, you just didn't want to join them because you just didn't feel like it. And while you're working and doing stuff, suddenly you feel this trigger or this urge to just go and get something to eat even though you just had dinner like one hour ago or 30 minutes ago. So that might be a potential emotional eating trigger. So other times could be say, you know, whenever it's time for exams or whenever the work at your company or in your business increases like um, your tendency to eat more increases as well. So these are also emotional eating triggers as well. So identify your emotional eating triggers. And there can be four, there can be five, there can be more than ten. It doesn't matter. The point is to identify them first. Okay, so some of my past emotional triggers would include like say, whenever I got home after from wherever, I will always feel a need to, to grab something to eat. Like, it didn't matter if I just had dinner with my friends or whatever. Like, I would just feel like I need to eat when I reach home. Another emotional trigger would be, say, when my parents get home, I will instinctively go to the kitchen, see what they bought, they bought and then want to eat something, like, instinctively. Like, even if they didn't buy anything that's food-related, I would still want to eat something. Um, other examples would be, say, Whenever I feel down or I feel like um, I'm not feeling as good, like I suddenly feel like I need to eat something, just instinctively. There are other times could be say when I have a lot of work to do or when I feel like um, like my to-do list is just not ending and then I would feel like I need to eat. So these were my emotional triggers and eating triggers in the past. Okay, so that's step one. Uh, feel free to pause right now if you want some time to think about your emotional eating triggers. So reflect back and think about the times where you felt like eating even though uh, physically you might not have needed to. Okay, so once you're done, let's now move to step two. And step two is about understanding why you eat under those situations. So every single belief is supported by certain... Uh, underlying reasons and these underlying reasons can be past circumstances so 
Um, it can be certain things that people said to you in the past, and you have to understand them if you truly want to break that belief. So understand why you eat under uh, those circumstances. So an example would be say, um, I guess in the past I had this underlying belief that I need to eat cake so during parties or celebrations, and I if don't if I don't eat that. Then I will feel like I'm missing something or I'm I'm missing out. So every time during like a birthday celebration, I I would feel like、uh, I have to wait for the cake. I have to eat the cake like at least one slice of it, and I'll feel like it's full of goodness and you know it's celebrating. It's good. So when I try to understand like this belief, then I realize like it was really because um in the past situations like since、uh, many years ago. In all the celebrations that I was in, there would always be cake, and it was always seen as the key event during the whole event. So it's it's like you have to wait for the cake. You can't go until the cake is there, and then、um, the cake is always would would always be offered to every single person, and every single person has to take the cake. Like there's、uh, no room for rejection. So seeing this happen again and again and again since young, that made me you know form this. Erroneous belief that I have to eat cake during parties, like it's just a must. There's there's not even room for discussion when that's actually not true. So that was the belief that I walked away when I was a child, and I, it stuck on with me up until say you know one year ago when I identified this eating trigger and I really look deep into it to understand it. So take as long as you need to answer this question, and. You can pause the video at this point to do this a step in depth. Okay, so once you are done, now go to step three, which is to detach eating from these triggers. So now that you have really understood why you eat during those uh, times, uh, those trigger moments, now. Detach eating from these triggers, and this step would be almost effortless if you have pro- done step two properly. So, if you truly, truly understand why you think about eating during those trigger moments, then you probably have already arrived at the realization that、um, th- those beliefs were just based on past situations, which might not even be reflective of reality. So in my previous example about the cake and eating cake during parties, it was just because of the way I was brought up that every single party I was in, cake was always seen as the key item, and、um, people usually do not allow you to reject、um, the cake. So that was what I based my belief on. But is that true? Is it true that I have to eat the cake? And the answer is no. Because I can reject the cake if I want to, and I can have a proper reason, like because I'm full. I have simply eaten what I need to eat for the day, and I just don't want to have the cake. That is reason enough. So, if you truly, truly understand what is the underlying driver behind the triggers, this step would be easy, and to properly detach eating from these triggers. First, understand how that link was formed in the first place, which is basically step two, and then recognize that this link is incongruent with reality. So try to look for instances whereby、uh, whatever you just wrote in step two is not true. So, like in the cake example,、uh, what I did was then I started looking for examples where people just simply don't eat cake and everything went fine. And obviously, there there were plenty of examples because there are always people who say like, "Okay, I'm full, and I don't want to eat the cake," or and so on. Okay, so if if you like to learn more about breaking disempowering beliefs, one in,、uh, useful article you can read on PE would be the root cause versus effects article, and I I guess that is what、um, that is like the underlying basis for a lot of things that I write on PE and a lot of the things that I share, and you can access this article. At personalexcellence.co/blog/root-cause.
Okay, so it's personalexcellence.co slash blog slash root dash cost. So root cost with the dash in between. Subsequently, um, a couple of the exercises on at, in Be a Better Me in 30 Days program, which is 30 PBM, uh, also help with breaking disempowering beliefs. And that's the, the tasks on day 26, which is to identify your limiting thoughts. And the task on day 27, which is to replace them with empowering thoughts. Okay, so now that we're done with step 3, now go to step 4. And step 4 is about resolving the triggers themselves. And um, this might be optional if you already effectively detach eating from those triggers and they don't bother you anymore. But um, that this step would apply for certain situations. So for example, let's say um, your trigger is actually stress. Like whenever you feel stress, you just uh, feel like you need to eat or else you go berserk. And um, detaching eating from stress is definitely essential. But here, the, there's something that's not resolved, which is why are you feeling stressed to begin with? So besides detaching eating from the stress, you also have to learn better stress management techniques so that the stress doesn't come again and again and again. Even if you detach eating from stress, something else is going to come in to fill the void. So you have to tackle the source of the stress as well. Okay, so after you are done, this would uh, the first four steps would have addressed um, some of the top triggers for your emotional eating. But chances are you're going to find more triggers in the future. So whenever uh, emotional eating triggers come up, simply repeat those steps. Um, which is a step two, to understand the reason behind the emotional eating trigger. And step three, which is to detach eating from these triggers. And then step four, which is to resolve the trigger themselves. So just keep doing them over and over, over and over, over and over again. And you'll eventually be left with, at, to be uh, at this point, where just, there are just no emotional eating triggers whatsoever. And when that happens, and when you're able to really look at food as just something that's neutral, something that's just meant to feed, fuel your body, that's when you know you're free from the reign of emotional eating. Now that you have listened to the first part of the web lecture, which is about tackling the causes of emotional eating, now let us move to part two, which is about how to rebuild a healthy relationship with food. So think of um, your mind as like a bucket and inside there are just many thoughts, many different beliefs. So the first part of our web lecture just now was really about removing those uh, false beliefs, um, those erroneous thoughts, and then just uh, taking them out of the bucket. And once you remove them, that means that there is now a void that is in place for you to fill something back in. And unless you fill it back in with the healthy, the right beliefs about food, um, what's going to happen is that other beliefs are going to come in to fill the void. And some of them may be negative, wrong beliefs about food and eating again. And then that's going to lead back into the situation of um, uh, bad eating habits, you know, and possibly even emotional eating again. So you want to make sure that here, after tackling the causes of emotional eating, after removing the triggers and detaching um, eating from these triggers, that you now fill your mind with the right notions surrounding eating and surrounding food. And this is what this is our focus for the second half. And here, I'll be sharing with you various tips on how to rebuild a healthy relationship with food. So uh, what I'm going to share here will be um, the same tips that I shared in part 6 of the Emotional Eating Guide. So again, that's uh, at personalexcellence.co slash blog slash emotional dash eating. Okay, so this will be uh, in part 6 of the guide. Okay, so now I'm going to move to the first tip on how to rebuild a healthy relationship with food. And the first tip is to stop eating based on unrelated factors, i.e. eat based on your needs. 
So I think a lot of people, they tend to eat based on factors that's just totally not related to uh, eating at all. So for example, they eat when their friends ask them to, okay? Oh, they eat because, okay, the clock says it's 12, I must eat now. Or even though that they've already eaten like an hour or 30 minutes before. Or they eat because there's food on the table. And since there's food on the table, I might, I might as well just eat, right? Or maybe they eat because uh, there's a celebration and I must eat to celebrate. Or maybe they had some good news and they feel like, okay, I'm obligated to eat. Okay, and so on and so forth. So all these are re factors that's just totally not related to eating at all. Okay, think about what food is for. Why did Mother Nature create food? And Mother Nature created food as a fuel to fuel us, to fuel our physical bodies, for us to, for us to live, for us to get the most energy out of our daily lives. And we should eat in line with such principles. In the times where we eat not in line with these principles, we eat because we like it, we eat because we want to feel happy, and so on. That is considered emotional eating. That is simply adding unnecessary emotions to an act that should be neutral. Now, once again, I am all for appreciating the goodness of food, loving it as you eat it, and, and uh, being grateful that you have uh, such a wonderful food. But it's a totally different thing altogether when you eat to chase a certain emotion, to feel good, because people say you, sh you should eat, because eating makes you feel happy. That is just totally uh, not related to eating itself. Okay. So in eating based on related factors, there are three reference points that I would suggest here. The first reference point would be hunger cues. So hunger cues would be say uh, when you feel that your stomach is very empty and you feel like it's time to nourish yourself with some food, then that would be uh, one of the cues to use to um, feed yourself, obviously with nutritious, with good food that is in line with your um, calorie and energy needs. So I think um, for, there'll, there'll be a certain group of people where this reference point might not be helpful and this will be the group of people who have, uh, who have so such serious problems with emotional e eating and binging that their uh, perception of hunger is just highly distorted. And it's also possible that perception of hunger can be one of the erroneous beliefs surrounding food. And I'll give you an example. So for example, for myself, I think like um, up until I address my emotional eating issues, I would constantly think that I'm hungry, even though I wasn't. And I always think like, oh my God, like I'm, I'm hungry, like I need to eat, I need to eat or I'll die, like I need to eat. And that was really um, uh, uh, like a thought that surfaced because I needed something else. So let's say... Um, there's, there's an instance where I needed love, um, I needed companionship, and remember that I, when I shared at the beginning of the lecture that I saw food as love subconsciously. So when I subconsciously thought things like, okay, I need love, I need companionship, that immediately linked to food because food was my best friend. You know, food was love to me. So then it translated to a conscious thought in my mind that, oh, I need food, I'm hungry, I need food. But it wasn't that I need food. It was that I needed love. I needed self-love and so on. So uh, you, it's very important that you learn to distinguish and discern that. And at the beginning, it might be hard. At the beginning, it just might seem like every single situation um, that you are, that in every single situation that you were hungry. But uh, as you do it over time, and as you do the first part of the exercise, which is about tackling the causes of emotional eating, it will help you to become more and more aware and learn to distinguish between when you are truly hungry and when you are just emotionally hungry. Okay, so anyway, this is the first reference point and there, there's, there's the second reference point which will help to address such situations. And the second reference point will be referring to your calorie needs. Okay, and the calorie needs will be calculated based on um, your... Uh, your, your body mass and then calculating it based on a certain formula. So there are various formulas um, and equations that you can use uh, to calculate what is uh, what are your energy needs and uh, the, the point is to calculate what is your TDEE and that stands for 
total daily energy expenditure. So um, the TDEE represents all the energy that you should need for the day, um, be it for uh, surviving, for doing your daily activities, uh, for sleeping, for your body processes to run, and so on. And that just represents the total number. Like as long as you eat within this number, then you actually you have actually uh, sufficiently fed yourself for the day. Obviously, um, there's also uh, something separate altogether, which is about um, ensuring that you're consuming nutrients in line with, uh, with your uh, body needs. Because let's say your TDEE is 2,000 calories. Um, there's totally a difference between eating 2,000 calories worth of donuts and eating 2,000 calories of food that comes from healthy sources. Um, but that's the third reference point, which I'll be talking about later. So um, it, with the TDEE, uh, calculate the number and ensure that you eat in line with that. So for those people who are looking to lose weight, then you should consume lower than the TDEE. And a recommended guideline is to uh, eat no more than a five, 500 calorie deficit. So as long as you stay within this um, uh, guideline, then there is no reason to think that you're depriving yourself or um, your body is getting to the lockdown or that uh, you are dying or anything like this. Okay. So that's the second reference point, eating in line with calorie needs. Okay, now let's now go to our third point, which is on nutritional needs. So like I said just now, um, knowing your calorie uh, needs every day is only um, one of the guide points, guiding points on eating sufficiently. And you want to ensure that the calories are coming from good places. So for example, uh, macro breakdowns like between protein and carbohydrate and fats and also ensure that you have enough vitamins and minerals so obviously different people have different dietary preferences um, different people have different perceptions on what are the required nutrient needs so um, that's something that I won't be going into here and it's out of the scope of the topic but ensure that um, you eat in line with your desired nutrient needs so three reference point first hunger cues the second calorie needs and then the third nutritional needs so always eat based on these three factors and don't eat based on any other factor. So any other factors uh, would basically be unrelated to eating and food itself. Okay, the second tip to uh, rebuilding a healthy relationship with food is to detach your emotions from food. So be conscious when you eat, be conscious when you're taking in food and be conscious about how you see food. So I think a lot of us like to say things like, I love this food or this food looks so sinful, like this is so indulging or I'm craving for food or like this is so tempting. I think it's fine to uh, use such words but be careful about your intentions when you say things like this because it represents um, uh, a sort of like um, unhealthy relationship with food because, like I said just now, food is something that's neutral. Okay, You can love food with all your might, but it's not going to love you back. And I'm someone who's saying this from example. I spent years trying to use food to feed myself um, as love. And each time I was upset, I would just keep eating, indulging, and forcing myself with food. And just eating as much as possible until I was so disgusted with myself. And in none of those episodes was I ever rewarded at the end emotionally. It made me feel worse about myself. And thinking about it, it was just because food was not able to give me the love that I thought it would. And naturally so, like it's a non-living being. And I think for anybody whose emotional triggers, um, emotional trigger to eat is because of uh, desire for love or, or desire for connection or, or whatever it is, then I think it's more important to understand that, uh, look into it, and then work on that consciously, rather than blindly using food as the cover up for such voids. So detach your emotions from food, recognize that it is a neutral object, that, that it is here to serve you, to help you, okay? but it's not here to love you. So a true healthy relationship is, is one where you just really see food as how it is something that's neutral, nothing more, nothing less.
you eat because you have to. You don't eat because you know you you love it or you need it or you crave for it. Okay, so just be very conscious of that. Now the third tip is to take ownership of your diet. So、um, looking back, I think a lot of times、uh, where I just ate. In、um, at a fashion that was not in line with my needs, would be when、um, I wasn't taking ownership of my diet. So I would like、uh, see like people、um, having food, and I I would think like, okay, I I have to eat this because they bought it. Or let's say my parents buy food at home, and I'll feel like I need to eat it, like it is、uh, my obligation. Or I'll sometimes put blame on them for buying junk food. Uh, which was causing me to eat the junk food, but when I think about all of these cases, it was simply because I was not taking ownership of my diet. I was putting the responsibility of my eating habits and my diet on other people. And the thing is, other people cannot be responsible for you, whether it's your life or your diet. You have to be responsible for yourself. So when I recognized that and when I took ownership of my diet, that was when everything just changed. Suddenly, I realized that I don't have to be obligated to eat whatever just because people are eating it or just because people bought it. Like, I am the owner of my diet. I choose what I put in my body, and doing this、uh, has made me really empowered. Like,、um, it really made me eat in line with the things that I should be eating, the, the things that、I、truly resonate and and believe to be the best for my body. And that has been tremendous in terms of、uh, having a healthy relationship with food. Okay, so just some quick tips on how you can do that、uh, in terms of taking ownership of your diet. The first is to know your ideal diet and then stick with that. The second is to do your own grocery shopping. Like, don't rely on other people to buy、uh, groceries for you, or don't rely on your parents. Uh, for those living in Asia, like most of us would be staying with our parents unless we're married. So chances are our parents are the ones who buy the groceries. So don't do that. Like、um, if they buy things that in line with what you want, then that's fine. But if they're not, then you should take your ownership of your own diet. So for myself, I do my own grocery shopping every week. So I go to the supermarket once or twice every week to buy the things that、uh, I want for my meals, and I prepare my own meals. So, thirdly, pack your food and meals. If、um, you don't find the food that are in line with what you want, like for example, at work, let's say the restaurants around your workplace are serve totally bad, unhealthy food, maybe you want to consider packing your your own meals. The fourth is to buy what you need. So, when you're at the restaurant, buy only what you want and what you finish. Don't just buy more than you need. The third is that recognize you have a choice to order sides over mains. So just because you're sitting in the restaurant doesn't mean that you have to buy that pasta or the pizza just because they're the mains. You can buy one side or a couple of sides if that's really just all you want. The sixth is don't order just to compromise. So don't feel like just because your friend eats like a soup and a salad and like a、um, a drink that you have to order all three, you can just get a salad if that's what you want. Number seven is to stop eating when you had your fill. So don't eat to clean the plate.、Um, I think a lot of us were probably brought up with the notion that we have to finish the plate or or finish the food on the plate, or we will not be、uh, we'll be doing a disservice to the kids in Africa. Okay, and it is good to be conscious of、um, the third world problems out there and famine conditions out there, but Um, the cleaning the plate wouldn't do any difference, like over to the situation over there. I think it's more important to recognize that if you are full before you finish the plate, that you yourself have ordered more than you need, and you should adjust your orders next time so as not to waste food. Because eating,、uh, buying more than you need, and then finishing that is wasting food.、Uh, all the same, it's just that the food is going to your stomach versus being thrown away. And what's worse is when you. Um, eat that excess food. Now you have to work on losing it through、um, dieting later on or exercise. So ordering food that's more than you need is really the first mistake. Eating it when you are already full is the second mistake. So 
correct them at the, the point and, and make sure it doesn't happen in the future rather than perpetuating the mistake. Okay, the eighth tip um, is to say no to food offers when you're hungry. So eat because you need to and not because you feel obligated. And I think a lot of us have difficulty saying, saying no. I have another web lecture which is on saying no that you can check out on my channel. But basically, say no to food offers when you are not hungry. Okay, so now going to the fourth tip on how to rebuild a healthy relationship with food. The fourth tip is to practice conscious eating. So I think a lot of us, um, when we eat, we're just totally not conscious. We're thinking about uh, something that just happened today or thinking about a problem uh, that we have to face in the upcoming week. Um, and we're thinking about someone else. We're thinking about some situation. And it's just not conscious at all. I think uh, when you eat, be conscious that you're eating and just really be in the moment. So don't multitask. Don't be watching movies or videos or what have you. Um, but just be in the moment. Okay, practice consciousness. Um, for example, like during my emotional eating episodes uh, in the past, I was just totally unconscious when I uh, ate. Like I could be downings, um, chips and, and um, biscuits and junk food and that would just happen so fast that uh, like a few minutes later it would seem as if I never ate at all like I, like my body um, and my stomach would be full but I can't even consciously remember when I ate those food and I think it's so important to be conscious of eating just as it is conscious uh, it's important to be conscious of everything that you do be aware, be present, because that is where you are. Okay, so some tips on how you can start eating consciously. First, like I said, don't mix eating with other activities. Second, know what you're eating. When you eat, examine the ingredients. Like, what is this made of? Like, what is the content of this food? Like, know that, and don't just put food blindly into your stomach. Thirdly, before you eat, feel the sensation of hunger in your stomach. And then fourthly, when you eat, examine the food. Look at the colors. Look at the composition of ingredients. Smell it if you desire. Like, know it. Because it's going into your, your stomach, your body. Fifthly, as you eat, do it one bite at a time. Chew slowly and deliberately. Relish the taste of food in your mouth. Feel the texture. Don't just like swallow in big mouthfuls and just chunk it down your body. Now the sixth, um, the sixth point is to be aware of how your stomach feels as you uh, eat the food. So remember that at the beginning, your stomach is empty. Like uh, you feel the sensation of hunger. So as you eat, like be conscious and be aware as your stomach slowly fills up. So, and the seventh point is then stop when you feel halfway full and or when you have consumed enough calories for the meal. Um, it is said that our body, it takes about 20 minutes for us to register when our stomach is full. So a lot of times when people stop because they feel full, it's because um, it is, they have already been full for a while. And when the, the fullness set in, they feel so bloated and so full that it's uncomfortable. So something that I do is now I just eat uh, very slowly, uh, just one bite at a time, just chew very slowly while being in the moment. And it helps me to recognize that uh, when my body is full and when to stop. So doing so helps you to be more in tune with your hunger cues and it helps you to be more conscious of the role of eating and food in your life. So that definitely helps you to build a healthy relationship with food. Okay, the fifth tip on how to rebuild a healthy relationship with, with food is to avoid addictive food. So addictive food refers to fast food, junk food, food that's highly processed, uh, food with a high level of sugar, salt, MSG, or artificial ingredients like flavors, sweeteners, and preservatives. So the problem with addictive food is that they throw your hunger cues off and uh, your natural hunger cues like they just distort it and they make you think like you need to eat something when you don't 
So for example, let's say chips or, or like Pringles. And um, in fact, the slogan for Pringles is like, once you pop, you can't stop. And then once you eat one, you just keep eating and eating and eating. And that's partly because um, part of the ingredients and the food makes you uh, want to eat more. Like it triggers uh, physical, um, like it, it makes your brain feel like, okay, I need to eat more or like, I know that's like, I need to have that taste in my mouth. And that's the same for a lot of junk food and fast food. Like some of them um, are purposely created with certain ingredients to just make you crave for more. And that is not what you want. You want to eat because um, it is in line with your needs because you need to and not because um, there are certain ingredients that are setting you off to eat more. So removing addictive food from your diet is a definite must. So the sixth point is to educate yourself on food, health, and nutrition. I think if you want to rebuild a healthy relationship with food, then you should know more about what food is, um, how it affects your health, and the nutrition behind them. Because you want to know what uh, you're feeding your body. Don't just eat blindly. Um, don't eat without knowing what you're feeding yourself with. And, and know what are the best, most nourishing food you can ever have in uh, living a healthy lifestyle. So for myself, I used to be very uh, nonchalant about what I eat and what I put in my body. But uh, I guess the whole emotional eating episode just made me a lot more um, conscious about healthy living. And today, I'm very proud to say that uh, I only feed myself with the most nourishing food. I say no when it's something that I don't want, when the food is unhealthy. And um, I prepare my meals that match my nutritional needs as much as possible. So that's something, that's a big change that I made in my life over the past few years. And that's something that I'm very proud of. Okay, the seventh and the last point on how to rebuild a healthy relationship with food is to nourish your body with the highest diet that you can ever have. Okay, so I think... Uh, what one defines specifically as the highest diet is relative, I think it's more important to ask yourself, what is the diet that is uh, best for your body, mind, your heart, and your soul? And eat in line with that. Because I think whenever you eat something and then it's not in line with your beliefs, then there's an incongruency right there. So for example, um, I feel that uh, eating meat is not in line with my personal values and beliefs because uh, for a non-cruelty world and because of that I choose to be a vegan okay so a vegan is someone who doesn't consume meat products or, or animal derived products like dairy or cheese or, or milk or eggs so I eat um, that uh, I consume a vegan diet and that's something that I feel very congruent very aligned with now, I don't think um, everyone should have a vegan diet. I think everyone should just eat whatever it is that they want. So, just it's, more, it's most important you eat what is in line with your beliefs, uh, what you feel is uh, most in line with your mind, what you feel is most nutritious for your body, what you feel most resonates with your heart, and what you feel is best for your soul. So like I said, different people have different beliefs, uh, but here are some quick tips on how you can start working towards your highest diet. So the first is create your ideal meal plan. Like for yourself, what is that ideal meal plan that meets your uh, calorie needs, your nutritional needs, and um, that really just fits with what you want to have for your day. So if you think about it, like for today, what is the kind of food that you want to eat that would be the most ideal to you? That when you consume that, you feel so charged up, like so fulfilled, and um, that you feel is so in line with your what your body needs. So write that out because I think it's very, very important to have your ideal meal plan such that, that you can work toward it rather than just um, eating whatever you see that's before you. Next. Get rid of the junk food. So just junk food is called junk food for a reason because it's junk. It's just zero nutritional value. Okay, so this includes things like chocolate candy bars and desserts, chips, burgers, etc. So 
like some of you might want to just have that once in a while and and if you feel like you need to do that um, then you can do that but recognize that all this food is just unhealthy for you it has zero nutritional value it does nothing whatsoever so get rid of them and work toward having a fast food and junk food free diet next always try to go for real food versus processed food so I think like a lot of food in our lives today is just processed they change from their natural states they have a lot of artificial ingredients added and it is probably hard to go to, um, to go for a diet that's 100% real food especially if um, you eat outside uh, a lot of the times because of social reasons and so on but try to um, go for real food wherever possible so like fruits, greens, um, food that has not been processed as much so know that this is like a direction to walk, uh, to walk toward and not like a hard and fast um, uh, black and white standard but just see it as um, a guideline that you can keep working toward so for myself I mean there's still processed food in my uh, meals today uh, for convenience reasons and uh, for practical reasons but I try to gravitate toward real food as much as I can next try to go for organic versus non-organic food where you can so organic uh, food refers to food that have been processed or produced using methods that do not involve modern synthetic inputs or genetic modification and or they don't have uh, chemical additives next um, go for options food options that have less sugar they are unsweetened they have low fat or no fat so these are the, like the healthier options next try to remove caffeine from your life I guess there are a lot of controversial studies regarding caffeine and then I guess the industry at times don't seem to really agree that like you have one study saying caffeine is good and one study saying that caffeine is bad but ultimately caffeine is a psychoactive stimulant drug and uh, my own personal take is that anything that's stimulating the body or like it's totally not necessary for the body is just, just not necessary and your body has no need for stimulants so just try to remove the stimulants out of your diet next try to eat more fruits and vegetables they're always good for your body I think a lot of people actually do not have enough vegetables in their diet every day so ensure that um, you fill yourself with these nutritious foods next try to go for healthier food preparation methods so for example um, steamed versus fried baked versus fried uh, raw versus roasted or salted nuts and so on and last but not least drink more water okay eight glasses a day ideally and um, I think the a good indicator to use surrounding uh, how much to drink is to just look at your lips like is it dehydrated is it dry or is it supple and hydrated so if your lips are dehydrated that is a sign that you are already dehydrated because um, like all these body signs usually um, show when we are already out of water so feel your throat um, like is it dry look at your lips is it dry and if it is then you should definitely drink more water that it is a sign that you're not drinking enough water and I think a lot of us don't drink enough water every day Okay, so um, if you like more tips on healthy living, be sure to check out personalexcellence.co slash blog slash healthy dash living. Okay, so on that article, there are like 45 tips on how to live a healthier life. Okay, so that's it for the second part of this web lecture, which is about rebuilding a healthy relationship with food. So, and that's it for the web lecture on emotional eating. I hope all of you have found this useful. Um, remember that emotional eating is really a symptom of um, like wrong beliefs surrounding food and eating and it is important that you address them. I know sometimes you can feel like the problem is so overwhelming, so big that um, it's hard to even uh, have a handle on it but just know that you have to start from somewhere. Um, it is fine that if you binged yesterday or if you're binging right now as you're listening to this 
Um, but the most important thing is that you start afresh the next day. Don't beat yourself up over emotional eating or binging because it is not your fault. I think it is more important that you work on addressing the problem, and you're not alone in in your emotional eating problems. I think many people in the society today actually suffer from the issue, and、um, a lot of readers on my site also talk、uh, very often about having emotional eating issues or not being able to stick to their diet. And you know, know that when you have a neutral relationship with food, sticking to your ideal diet and ideal plan is just seamless. There's no effort whatsoever required to maintain that diet, simply because you no longer have a wrong belief surrounding food. You no longer have、uh, wrong emotional attachment surrounding food. So I wish you all the best in rebuilding a healthy relationship with food. Listen to this web lecture again and again as needed to reinforce、um, the tips that I've just shared. And know that as long as you just keep on it, it will eventually be resolved. So for myself, it took like over a year or like about a year of consciously working on this. Problem to finally resolve it, and when I did,、um, it was really like a big liberation. And today I'm free from the the problems, and I also hope that you will、uh, soon be free of emotional eating. So for more web lectures, go to youtube.com/celestinchua to read more about the emotional eating series. Go to personalexcellence.co/blog/emotional-eating. And thanks for listening. Look forward to seeing you guys in the next lecture. Bye.